Hello and welcome back. You're watching Parry This. Today we are tackling another famous knight from Arthurian lore and legend, and that knight is no other than Sir Galahad the Pure. An interesting character, foretold before his time, who in a famously short amount of time was able to accomplish more than any of his fellow knights of the round table, and to claim the title of greatest knight in all the realms. So let's dive on in and see what this character is all about. The addition of Galahad to the Arthurian legends was done relatively later in the traditions. Galahad isn't mentioned in any of the early works, including the writings of Chrétien de Troyes, but does appear later on in the 13th century Old French Arthurian epic, the interconnected set of romances known as the Vulgate Cycle. Sir Galahad may have originally come from the fourth book of the Vulgate Cycle, which was derived from the Cistercian Order. As a matter of fact, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux is often credited with the creation of the monastic knight, who displays ideal chivalry, and is referred to in his works on the Knights Templar. The circumstances surrounding Galahad's conception derive from the earlier parts of Grail prose cycles. It takes place when King Arthur's greatest knight, Lancelot, mistakes Elaine of Corbenic for his secret mistress, Queen Guinevere. In the French tale used by Thomas Mallory, King Pelis has already received magical foreknowledge that Lancelot will give his daughter a child, and that that this little boy will grow to become the greatest knight in the world, the knight chosen by God to discover the Holy Grail. Pelis also knows that Lancelot will only lie with his one true love, Guinevere. King Pelis comes to the conclusion that destiny will have to be helped along, so he enlists the aid of Dame Brucen, who was one of the greatest enchantresses of the time. She gives Pelis a magic ring that makes Elaine take on the appearance of Guinevere, and enables her to spend a night with Lancelot. Of course, as soon as Lancelot discovered that he had been deceived, and that he was sleeping with an unmarried princess instead of the wife of his king, he backed out of there faster than a startled crawfish. It is noted that out of anger he drew his sword on Elaine, but spared her because it was revealed to him that they had conceived a son together. He forgives Elaine for the deception, but has no wish to marry her or even to see her again. Lancelot then leaves and returns to Arthur's court where he can resume his affair. Nine months later, Galahad is born, and he is then placed in the care of his great aunt, who is the abbess at a nunnery. He is then raised there by the nuns. According to the 13th century Old French prose Lancelot, Galahad was actually Lancelot's original name, but it was changed when he was a child. At his birth, therefore, Galahad is given his father's own original name. Merlin prophecies that Galahad will surpass his father in valor and be successful in the search for the Holy Grail. Pelis, Galahad's maternal grandfather, is portrayed as a descendant of Joseph of Arimathea's brother-in-law, Bronn, also known as Galahad whose line had been entrusted with the grail by Joseph. For those of you unaware of the significance of this, Joseph of Arimathea was a man who re assumed responsibility for the burial of Jesus after his crucifixion. He was a rich man who was also a high-ranking member of the council. It is said that he had long been a secret apostle of Jesus Christ, and that seeking the kingdom of heaven, he took responsibility for Jesus' burial and even donated his own tomb for Jesus to be buried in. The Roman Catholic Church venerates him as a saint. Numerous stories arose during the medieval period connecting him with Glastonbury, England, and also in entangling him in the Holy Grail legend. In short, it is believed that Jesus entrusted him with the Holy Grail, and down through the line of protectors, the Knights Templar would eventually be formed with the purpose of protecting the Holy Grail. But back to the topic at hand. Galahad is raised and educated at a nunnery, where he learns all of the contemporary studies of the time, becoming a well-versed and literate adult. He also was educated in the faith, with the original intent of following the priesthood. When he reached his teenage years, he began to take an interest in the sword, and was educated in chivalry, swordsmanship, and the lance. He immediately took to these studies as well, if not better than his previous ones. When Galahad reached adulthood, he defeated Lancelot at the lists as a mystery knight, and then followed it up by handily defeating him with the sword in a duel. Once Galahad revealed his true identity, Lancelot admitted that he was superior with the lance and the sword, and knighted Galahad on the spot. Lancelot then set out with Galahad to King Arthur's court. It is said that Galahad arrived at Camelot during Pentecost, where he was accompanied by a very old knight who immediately leads him over to the round table and unveils his seat at the Siege Perilous, an unused chair that has been kept vacant for the sole person who will succeed in the quest for the Holy Grail. I have not been able to find the name of the knight who accompanied him. It is most likely it was one of the less famous knights of the round table. There were, after all, over 200 of them. I also found a theory that it was Merlin in disguise, as he had been watching over him for his whole life with this specific intent. 
This chair was still empty, as for all others who had aspired to sit there, it had immediately proved fatal. Galahad survived this test, witnessed by Arthur, who, upon realizing the greatness of this new knight, leads him over to the river where a magic sword lies in a stone, with an inscription reading, Never shall man take me hence, but only he by whose side I ought to hang, and he shall be the best knight in the world. Galahad accomplishes this test with ease, and Arthur swiftly proclaims him to be the best knight ever. Galahad is promptly invited to become a Knight of the Round Table, and soon afterwards Arthur's court witnesses an ethereal vision of the Grail. The quest to seek out this holy object is begun at once. At this time, caught up in the fervor and excitement of Galahad's acts, and the vision that they all had, every one of Arthur's Knights of the Round Table set out to find the grail. It is Galahad who takes the initiative to begin the search for the grail. The rest of the knights follow him. Arthur is sorrowful that all the knights have embarked thus, for he discerns that many will never be seen again, dying on their quest. Arthur fears that this is the beginning of the end for the round table. This might be as a theological statement that concludes that earthly endeavors must take second place to the pursuit of the holy. Galahad in some ways mirrors Arthur, drawing a sword from a stone in a way that Arthur did. In this manner, Galahad is declared to be the Chosen One. Further, uniquely among the Round Table, Galahad is capable of doing miracles such as banishing demons and healing the sick. For the most part, he travels alone during the Grail Quest, for the most part smiting but sometimes sparing his enemies, rescuing fellow knights including Percival and saving maidens in distress, until he is finally reunited with Sir Bors and Sir Percival. These three knights then come across Percival's sister, who leads them to the mystical ship of Solomon, which they use to cross the sea to an island where Galahad then finds King David's sword. After many adventures, Galahad and Percival find themselves in a mystical castle of Corbinic at the courts of Pelis and Eleazar, his son. These men bring Galahad into a room, where he is finally allowed to see the Holy Grail. Galahad is asked to take the vessel to the holy island Saras. After seeing the Grail, Galahad, however, makes the request that he may die at the time of his choosing. So it is, while making his way back to Arthur's court, Galahad is visited visited by Joseph of Arimathea, and thus experiences such glorious rapture that he makes his request to die. Galahad bids Percival and Sir Bors farewell, after which angels appear to take him to heaven. His ascension is witnessed by Sir Bors and Sir Percival at this time. Galahad's success in the high religious endeavor that was the search for the Holy Grail was predicted before his birth, not only by Pelis, but also by Merlin, who once had told Uther Pendragon that there was one who would fill the place at the table of Joseph, but that he was not yet born. At first, this knight was believed to be Percival. However, it is later discovered to be Galahad. Galahad's conception is later glossed by Mallory in Le Morte de Arthur, and so by enchantment Elaine won the love of Lancelot, and certainly she loved him again passing well. Galahad was conceived for the divine purpose of seeking the Holy Grail, but this happened through pure deceit, under a cloak of deception that was very similar, in fact, to that which led to the conception of Arthur, and of Merlin himself. Despite this, Galahad is the knight who is chosen to find the Holy Grail. Galahad, in both the Lancelot Grail Cycle and Mallory's retelling, is exalted above all other knights. He is the one worthy enough to have the Holy Grail revealed to him and then to be taken into heaven. Galahad's ascension is quite possibly the most interesting thing about any of the stories that include him in Arthurian legend, for only two people are previously said to have ascended to heaven in this way, those people being Jesus Christ and Mary the Mother of Jesus. So, a pretty impressive feat all in of itself. Galahad doesn't get as much attention in books, TV, or movies as many of the other Knights of the Round Table. There are, of course, the original texts, which I have referenced so far in this video essay. He plays a major role in Thomas Berger's Arthur Rex. However, a lot of creative license is taken around the character, particularly with how he is received by the Knights of the Round Table, and then, of course, surrounding his death. I find the book to be interesting, but Galahad's character is not done justice in my opinion. He also appears briefly in Andrew Subkovsky's The Lady of the Lake, the final installment in the Witcher series. He is only in it briefly and is made fun of by Ciri for being a virgin. As far as movies are concerned, he of course shows up in Monty Python's Quest for the Holy Grail, where his purity is the subject of a scene where he is tempted by a castle full of horny nuns. He is in the 2004 action movie, King Arthur, but plays a relatively minor role, and I don't think he even has any lines. Finally, he is honored, although not portrayed, by Colin Firth in the 
Kingsman movies, as this is Colin Firth's character's codename in these movies. Well, that just about does it for Sir Galahad the Pure. Despite the nihilistic approach modern media has taken with him, I think he is a very interesting and very complex character in his own way. Very rarely do tools of destiny achieve so much while willing all of their trust to a higher power as Galahad did. If I were to rank him, including the knights I have already covered, I would say that Gawain is better with the sword than Lancelot, and Lancelot is better with the lance than Gawain. However, I believe that Galahad is better with the sword than Gawain is, and better with the lance than Lancelot. But that's just my take. What is your opinion of this storied young knight? Let me know in the comments section. In any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.